Yeah, go ahead. Get it started. Sure. Yeah. Well, what's the thing? Does anybody know any rods? <laughs> Somebody's dropping a beat. Uncle, drop me a beat. <laughs> Not too rough. Yeah, where's my? I don't have my chimes in here. Oh. I only know the the doors. Go like on the other side. This doesn't vibe with the flute, though. All right, we are live. We're live on Facebook, live on Zoom. Welcome everybody. Welcome to what's your story? Conversations on make mindfulness. Thank you so much, Indy, for giving us that wonderful intro. This is your host, Dr. Varun Gandhi. Love and abundance, everybody. Uh, so this show is an exploration of our world. We talk about issues pertaining to the South Asian community, but are not limited to us. They're shared across every community. The question is, how can we move the needle on these issues? One way is through having these conversations, by talking about it, by learning about it, by reaching out to people who don't look like you and having these uncomfortable conversations. You know, we call this the land of the free, but we really don't have freedom because we're bound by hate, by shame, by abuse, by rejection, by not taking control of our mind, by our differences. And because of all of these chains, we are divided. So that's what this story, or that's what this conversation is about. In our first few episodes, we discussed mental health, colorism, and women's abuse in South Asian communities across the world. Some of our future topics include yoga appropriation, men's abuse, and immigrating to the US. But today's conversation, is on mindfulness. Today, we're gonna to learn what the essence of mindfulness is. We'll dive deep into how we may be misusing mindfulness. We would never think mindfulness has anything to do with war. We'll find out today what that connection is. We would never think mindfulness can be weaponized against humanity. We'll find more about that tonight. We would never think mindfulness can be misused for ulterior motives. We'll also learn about that tonight. So before we introduce our panelists, I would like to thank our sponsors, Nita Naturals, which is an Ayurvedic beauty and wellness brand that offers skincare products for both women and men. Their products are made with botanical, vegan, and organic in ingredients and include facial oils, beard oil, masks, toners, natural perfumes, and colognes. You can find Nita Naturals on loveabundancestore.com. I'd also like to thank our collaborators. And among these collaborators, different organizations, and the many, many, many supporters who have shared our posts on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you all for making this happen. So really quick, a few pieces of announcements. This is a safe space. There is no judgment. So please share your experiences. And audience, please ask your questions without any reservation. If you'd like, you can keep your questions anonymous. And also feel free to ask questions at any time. Whenever you think about it, just type it in so you don't have to remember it. And when the right time comes, we'll answer it during this discussion. So now on to our panelists. Ritu, welcome Ritu. Ritu Riyat is a public health professional dedicated to helping individuals and organizations curb stress, anxiety, and burnout as a health coach workplace wellness expert, epidemiologist, yoga instructor, and meditation teacher. She's the founder of the Stress Detox Program and the creator of the highly rated Stress Detox course on Udemy for business, which has reached over 3,500 students to date. Welcome, Ritu. Can you tell us your kind of story behind 
the stress detox program and how you've uh, come here so far. And the first one to go. Sure. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you for having me here. I'm really um, curious, I guess, about this conversation. And I posted it, shared this with my audience yesterday, and I presented it as I'm here as a student first of meditation and then a teacher. So I'm curious um, to explore these topics about uh, what is the commoditization of mindfulness for meditation doing to meditation and is it serving us? Um, so just to share a little backstory of me, um, as you mentioned, I am a public health professional. My lens into health and wellness has been from this place of how can we and I help people make more informed choices about their health and well-being. And there's no shortage of information out there on what you need to do, but people are not doing it. And ultimately, it comes down to ourselves in order to make those changes in our behavior. Um, and where I think meditation plays a huge role because it does help us to become more aware of the choices that we're making. And that's where I think mindfulness and meditation is extremely important in, in making us aware of our automatic programming, mm. um, which is always operating in the background mm. of our life. And if we're trying to affect change outside of us, we need to start by affecting that change within us. And in order to do that, you need to know where you are in this moment. And it's changing moment to moment, right? Like what are those biases that are at play mm -hmm. every single moment, whether that's when you interact with somebody or, you know, recently, like I've been hearing these stories with like people shaming one another amongst this whole COVID pandemic. If somebody chooses to, you know, go out and see somebody and if somebody chooses not to. And so just recognizing our own biases that absolutely exist amongst everyone and then creating change um, using this tool, very, very, very powerful tool of meditation. Uh, my personal story with it is been a long time, you know, just challenged with stress and anxiety. And I've been in this world of wellness for a long time as well. And I've done the diet, the exercise, and it wasn't until probably 2009 when mm -hmm. I decided to really explore meditation and struggled a lot with sitting and just being with my thoughts, um, like many people do when they start out. And so I decided to dive right in and do a Vipassana, which for those of you who are not familiar, it's a 10 day silent meditation retreat. Um, and it really comes from the lineage of the Buddha himself and Vipassana means to see things as they are. And so for 10 days, 10 whole days, um, you're meditating 10 hours a day, you're in complete silence. So no talking, no writing, no reading, no eye contact, even though you're around other people. And um, that was where that was a huge mind shift for me to learn like really and explore on a on an experiential level what it truly that change is truly constant and wow the power of the mind can i um, can i throw can i just throw in there real quick with you like what do you think if, like more of our aunties and uncles did that like in, in the multiple <laughs> cultures multiple well, religions, just like indians like latino everything like immigrants mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if they did do that yeah and actually Vipassana, you know, you'd be surprised, like here in California, I went to the North Fork Center and there are a lot of aunties and uncles. So for anyone that says, oh, I can't sit on the ground, they have chairs. Like there are people that come to Vipassana and the beauty of Vipassana is that it is donation based, mm -hmm. right? And this is where like truly the therapy of meditation as the Buddha had said himself, it's not about the money. It's just about sharing this sharing this knowledge and so the Pasana centers were built on um, a pay it forward uh, kind of framework and so it's completely donation based you do, you pay you don't pay a single penny the day you sign up and it's not until the end of the 10 days where you're able to donate mm -hmm. so for 10 days you in theory are living like a monk you are you know you're in staying in the, the quarters that they provide you they you're eating the vegetarian, delicious vegetarian meals that they're preparing, that the volunteers are preparing. And it's all just received as an offering. So that ca catapulted my personal um, journey with meditation. And it's an ongoing journey, you know, by no means do I think of myself as a guru. I just think like the more I practice, the less 
I really know and the more there is to explore within this um, mind space field up here. Thank you so much, Rita. Yeah, you know, I definitely, when I started meditation as well, I had the same experience. It took me a long time to just sit down and do it for five minutes. Yeah. And initially the first three, four months was, I couldn't even do five minutes. I would want to get up after three, four, you know, and the, but I could come back to it the next day and sit down and do it. And that's kind of what did it for me mm -hmm. um, initially. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Next we have Shafali Tahiri. Shafali is a healer, a yoga and meditation teacher, a licensed aesthetician, an author of What Lights You Up, Reflection of a Modern Mystic. She provides a deeply intimate reflection on her 20-year struggle with being highly sensitive and how she turned it into her biggest strength, as well as the life lessons she's learned through the guidance of gurus and mentors. As she steps into the role of a mother, wife, and mystic, she encourages others to connect with peace, love, and passion as a way to live a life that lights up ourselves and all those around us. Welcome, Shafali. Thank you. What Thanks. started your journey on this path of meditation and yoga? Um, so for me, it was having challenges with really strong emotions and uh, finding real solace in going to a yoga class um, doing a yoga video and I was really young like I, you know and I grew up with a mom who prays twice a day at home meditates so like you know it wasn't unfamiliar to me uh, but it was it was more through like finding um, personal solace strong emotions and then kind of becoming obsessed with it and uh, you know getting into yoga at a young age probably more for like uh, vanity as well like hey you know it's balancing my emotions but I, i'm like you know feeling good looking good this is great and then it was after years and years i've been teaching for 15 years that i, I started peeling back deeper layers and you know mm -hmm. kind of going even more deep into these practices to to find like you know major shifts and right. you know the looking good was like you know just peeling back a layer of like okay what's really there you know what's mm -hmm. really it's not to say I don't like to look good, but it's like coming from a different place than before. Not a need for like the outside validation and uh, you know things that I was seeking for outside of myself that I had to discover on my own journey and path of you know lots of struggles too. That um, it all is within. Right, right. Thank you, Shafali. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, it's great yeah. to have you here. It's great to be here. Next, we have Indy Rishi Singh. Indy is an example of the intersection of East and West. He left Western allopathic medicine after experiencing burnout and dove deep into Ayurveda and yoga therapy. Today, he introduces self-care practices to nurses, doctors, police officers, corporations, and more. He recently worked with the San Francisco PD, teaching them mindfulness. Welcome, Indy. How are you doing today? I love that. I'm awesome, man. I, 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 you, you, I feel so like, um, I, like uh, embarrassed by your introduction that my nose turned red. You know, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, you know, like you know when you get like blushed. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> my nose turns red when when people like say nice things about me. Um, but uh, but 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 in honesty, in honesty, right? Like th this whole journey, where, where at least where I'm at in my life is like, I just can't go about life not laughing. Like it's just like. Yeah, that doesn't mean I don't take things seriously. It doesn't mean that I don't like think that there's problems going on in our like in our own lives, in our mm. communities, with our families, in many different ways. But I just can't imagine dealing with those problems anymore without laughing a little bit. Like, right. I just can't imagine it. So my journey has been this like kind of cultivation of my own joy, my own joyfulness. I'll take this off. It's distracting. Um, but also like not taking myself so seriously, guys. Like, you know yeah. what? Like, and I notice that when I do that, I'm more receptive to learn more and I'm more receptive to like listen to other people and like be open even to children, to learn from children, to learn from animals, to learn from people. Me not taking myself seriously. Also, like I have fun more, like I have so much fun in life, you know, and even when I'm dealing with problems, I'm having fun. Um, but I must say at the same time, for me, it's been really also kind of understanding that like how we don't have this basic cultivation of our soul, right? Like from our, from growing 
even I was, I'm, I was born sick. We don't really practice as sick. You, the religion, the orthodoxy doesn't teach us about soulfulness, right? We kind of have to find that through some sort of terrible things happen in our lives, which that happened to me, you know, like leaving medical school wasn't a choice. It like was forced on me. Like I actually, I broke down. I had a nervous breakdown, many of them actually, but it, it, it took one really bad situation to take it over the top. And then I didn't have any sort of support group. I didn't have any sort of like, whoa, like I didn't, you know, I didn't have what I have now. And I like, imagine if I had that at that time, it would have saved a lot, not just my life, but it, was so, it would have helped a lot more people at that time. So for me to reach back out, to like reach back out to people who are nurses or doctors and be able to support them, um, to reach out to communities that don't really have this unless they're wealthy, right? A lot of wealthy people get access to mindfulness and yoga. What about the people who don't have access, who actually need it more, right? People suffering from chronic illnesses, um, food deserts, um, knowledge deserts, right? Where like they're not, their access to information is kind of like really, it's not helpful. So like for me, it's, been, it's a passion, right? It's a passion also to connect to myself. I'm keep seeking the mystics journey. You know, I love being in that space of being like unknown, but also being a scientist. You know, and so I love the, you know, coming together, those two worlds of being a scientist and being mystic and going to the mystery. Um, and at the same time, sharing, like whatever happened, it's so much fun sharing, so much fun creating containers, creating spaces. There's just so much joy in creating the space for people to grow. And sometimes the best place for that grow, growing to happen, and I'll, I'll end on this, is when we are like, okay with not knowing. Like when we don't know, when we like don't know, like, I don't know, like that's, freaking awesome <laughs> like all kinds of crazy shit can happen when we go like i don't know and and I, and really that container if i don't know is like such a joy because curiosity and cultivate so many things can happen so i'll leave it on that we'll continue the conversation that's that's the source of unlimited potential i don't know no right that's gonna be that's gonna be my cult when i start it so you guys are all welcome to join i don't know where you're gonna meet i don't know how much it costs i don't know anything this is i don't know cult all right I so yeah I'm in. <laughs> I think that's why I started this conversation too on McMindfulness because I don't know. Oh. That's why I joined. I was like, I don't know, but sure, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. Yeah, <laughs> All right. Thank you, Indy. Welcome. And uh, lastly, we have Onkar Singh Dinsa. Onkar is a mindset coach and content creator focused on bringing mental health and wellness accessibility to the South Asian community. Coach Onkar teaches social emotional intelligence and mind body awareness with clients ranging from teenagers to young parents welcome onkar how are you doing today man good man good thank you for having me on um yeah so i've been thinking um ever since you invited me man i mean the name of this conversation make mindfulness has got me thinking a lot uh, i've been i've been talking about it a lot myself i've been the way i would kind of describe my journey with it is a journey a journey of coming almost full circle um, I think it's no uh, accident that we have, you know, five brown people like having this conversation. I think it's beautiful because as Indy's saying, you know, um, as he described with himself is that, you know, it's like a meeting of the East and West. I'm a first generation. I was born in America, uh, but I was born to, I was also born um, into a Sikh family, very Orthodox, Amritari we call it. Um, as I kind of translate that to English, it'd be like, if we, you know, like Orthodox fully baptized into the religion, long hair, beards, got the like you know praying everything so i was born into that and um so my journey with mindfulness starts with spirituality um so it started with spirituality uh you know balancing the two worlds <clears throat> without even having to you know consciously be aware of that right like I had, it was like survival you know it's like one thing in the house go to you start school and it's another way of like navigating i wore a turban you know having to navigate all of that um, there was a lot of childhood trauma with, you know, discrimination, racism, um, for wearing a turban. I mean, but in general, you know, I was like the only Indian kid at the school. Um, so I think those two together, you know, first, like, you know, getting in touch with spirituality, getting in touch with religion um, on a deeper level, too. Like, you know, I spent my in Sikhism, you know, when you um, read through, you talk about giving back like this uh, Vipassana, that sentiment is like very strong in Sikhism. I mean, you know, you don't, you don't, we have langar, the uh, langar seva, where you get free food at the Gurdwara, um, you know, for every service that's there. And the people that put on that service is, is the people, right? Like, you know, it's like, people are like dying to sign up when it's the new year. People want all the big days, like, oh, I want to, you know, like serve food at this Gurdwara. So for my family, even, it was a tradition to serve and give back to the community on big days in our lives. So I spent all of my birthdays at the Gurdwara, you know, giving, doing seva and helping other people. Um, so it was very ingrained in me to not always think about myself, 
Mm. Um, but then being a Southeast Asian or South Asian and just, you know, the immigrant mentality uh, coming from nothing, uh, it, which will be very interesting to hear from you guys' perspectives as well, that, you know, coming up, it's like, you know, you have to learn this game too. And so um, that's why I'm very curious to see, you know, how you guys have kind of, you know, brought the two together yourselves. Uh, but it's been interesting for me, you know, I, um, as, I got, as I got older, I first stepped into teaching. I was a teacher, I was a high school teacher. And I, I really felt like I found my niche. But I think that, um, you know, as, a, as somebody that's kind of been struggling to kind of bring the two together, um, I think like the individualistic side of things kind of took me away from teaching. I'll be honest, it, it just wasn't mm -hmm. enough for me. Like, I didn't feel like I was having enough of an impact, nor did I feel like I was being taken care of. Like, could I do this for a long time? So it was actually out of, yeah, out of, you can call it vanity, out of just thinking about myself, self-interest where I moved out of that and, you know, started looking into coaching and helping other people on a, a broader scale. Uh, that's where I implemented influencing, um, social media. Um, but at the same time, you know, as Indy was saying with, with med school, for me, it was, again, the pressures of, of exactly what mindfulness has become, right? Like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to help people, but then we have to have it measurable. It has to be at a certain level and performance and this and that. And I think that's what really, brought down my mental health. And so at that point is when things really came all the way together for me. Um, it's like I had all these tools within myself, spirituality, getting in touch with myself, awareness, um, that I just wasn't ready to look at yet. So now that I was kind of like putting all these tools together from all these different facets, I'm at where I am now and uh, getting the opportunity to help other people do the same thing. Wow, that's a fascinating story, man. You know, like you said, yeah, I did have something similar too, where I was a, a so I have a PhD in environmental engineering, and I was an engineer before I was this, you know, whatever I'm doing right now with meditation, meditation coach, and you know, having these conversations. Uh, and even though I was helping with the public health infrastructure, I was making sure that the systems in place were working as it should for our public, for our drinking water systems that, you know, the, 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 what comes in our tap. I didn't find meaning in it. I didn't find purpose in it because our water is already so clean. Yeah, you hear about Flint, Michigan, you hear about certain cases, but overall our water was already so clean that I didn't feel like I was making a purpose. And that's what kind of got me onto this journey of, hey, let me search for myself because that was the traditional path. Let's get a PhD, let's get a good degree, let's find a job. And what's next but then i didn't really care about all of that and that's kind of got what got me onto this journey and it's it's been the best thing i could have ever asked for because it's been so amazing i get to learn so much i mean i i just i wouldn't go back to anything else i would yeah. not yeah Amen. you're very good beta you're doing a very <laughs> good one, number one you know that very was strong. that was that was the struggle that was the struggle the parents you know, the people in the family were like, no, you got to stick to it. And I was like, why? I'm not happy. You know, it's, it's time <laughs> for me to find something that, that I want to do that I really care for. Yeah. Um, so, hey, so before we get to the McMindfulness, before we get to the Mick in McMindfulness, let's talk about what McMindfulness really is, right? So, Ritu, do you want to start off with that? What mindfulness really is? Yeah. Um, I think I, I kind of alluded to it earlier when I was just sharing my story in a bit is but mindfulness to me really means is uh, being able to um, have that awareness of the mind and awareness of that automatic program right like we grow up with things that are imposed on us like each of us have shared and it was not by choice and we try to make sense of the world because that's what our mind is doing and it it like creates patterns and like organizes these different experiences what's safe what's not safe and at some point you just get on autopilot. And unless you actively try to break that patterning, you're just going to keep operating from that autopilot. And so that's where mindfulness comes into play is becoming aware. And it just takes a microsecond, right? We're creating, I don't know, maybe Indy knows the stats on this, X amount of thoughts, generating them moment to moment to moment and just acting. And we've gotten especially here in the Bay Area, it's like that rat race, right? We're all in this big pause now. And, and in a way, this big pause is that mindfulness, right? It's almost like the universe is like, we're just having a mindful moment here. But each of us can do that by just 
becoming aware of what that program is and questioning it, right? Like questioning things. And I know for me growing up, as you guys have all said, is I grew up first generation American. I was born and raised here. I grew up trying to figure out the two worlds of being an Indian girl at home and then trying to fit in at school. And then on top of that, like I, my, you know, I'm half Sikh and half Hindu. And so it's like, add all these dimensions of, okay, we're going to the Mandar, we're going to the Gurdwara, there's X million gods and all these, and then all these mythology and all the gurus and just kind of make sense of all of that. Um, and, and then the, the, the key part is like trying to fit in, right? Like I was constantly trying to fit in. So something is being suppressed at some point so that you can fit in in that moment and become the chameleon. And now as an adult, it's like, that's that. Like, I'm not trying to fit in. Like, I'm just trying to be. And the people that, you know, I fit with will, I will attract. And that's what's happening. But it's a challenge to get to that place. And it does take that mindfulness that like, builds that resilience where you just develop your own inner faith of, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. Right? This too shall pass. Like, and again, go, that's where... Pasana came into play for me because it truly did let me experience that nothing, whatever I'm experiencing, whatever feeling, it's not going to feel that way forever. Like it will pass and then something else will arise. So long answer to the, the question of what is mindfulness, it's really that awareness, that pause of recognizing and questioning like what your actions are. Right, right. Shafali, do you want to add anything to this? Um, I completely agree that it's like a uh, hyper awareness, really. And um, especially so with like, uh, in my experience, feelings, right? Like first, it's like the, what the other sense is taking it and like what puts you like right in the moment, but also like checking in with how we're feeling, especially like, you know, we've all talked about this dichotomy growing up, like feeling pressures, uh, culture, wanting to fit in. Um, my, my kind of uh, pressure came especially in uh, like uh, uh, my romantic life. It was, my parents were always open to what I wanted to do career-wise. They like, I started out as a biology major in college, but then decided I wanted to switch to business to open up my own spas and wellness centers. And I realized only later, like 20 years later, that I'm kind of like kidding myself in that too. Like I actually would have preferred to be in like the art school. Um, but like I was justifying it. Like, yeah, I, I want to do spas. That sounds good. Because there was still like a certain kind of self-expression in that, you know, entrepreneurial venture, which I did, you know, go on to start my skincare line 12 years ago. Um, but in relationships, there was like a huge, like, you know, you've got to marry an Indian and you know at 20 years old I fell like really deeply in love with you know a white British guy and kept it from my parents and it really uh, it got to me it consumed me I, the pressure like with the pressures I ended the relationship but then it sent me um, spiraling into a kind of depression you know which I didn't realize at the time uh, but for, you know, only in retrospect, it's like, you know, crying every day for two years. There's like, there's something going on there. And that's actually when I truly found solace in yoga. It was like the only time I wasn't, you know, upset or crying. And, but it was like, I had to come back to the moments to, to balance with my mental health, like that I was having like challenges with, and also like, you know, with that pause, find like what are my senses taking in? How do I really feel about something? How do I really feel? Because it's like I could kid myself too about like how I was doing, you know? And it's like it, sometimes in the Indian culture, it's looked down upon to admit that you're not feeling so great, you know? Like I don't feel okay, I feel sad, depressed. Like, no, everything's always supposed to be happy. Well, that's not always the case, you know? And it's it's hard to be in an environment at least grow up in an environment where it's not normalized to talk about like deep sad feelings so basically since the age of nine I turned to a journal and that's kind of like you know keeping that for 30 years I turned it into kind of my book you know that I just wrote 
but yeah, it's mindfulness is, you know, like really that hyper awareness and especially like checking in with like how you feel and the more you can be present in like what the senses are taking in, the more you can come back to that, like, you know, tapping in to like what's really going on. Right. Right. Fantastic. Yeah. You know, uh, you brought up depression and uh, just recently we had uh, someone who had postpartum depression and she committed suicide. I don't know if you heard about that in the South Asian community. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people are talking about it and that's, it's, it's raising awareness, which is, you know, a good thing. Unfortunately, it had to happen after someone had lost their life. Um, but yeah. Uh, Onkar, what is, what is right mindfulness and what is wrong mindfulness in the Buddhist tradition? Absolutely. Um, now you give me a lot of power asking me that question. Um, I had to think about it for a while. Um, so before I answer that, I do want to just say that, um, with my journey, um, I wasn't, yes, I grew up in Sikhism, but I feel like a lot of, maybe you guys have described as well, that um, it wasn't always on my terms though, right? So I, I feel like it was kind of shoved down in my throat in a lot of ways. And I mean, obviously this is why I don't, I, I, you know, along that journey, I've cut my hair, I've tried to find my own way back into what resonates with me. Um, but yeah, I didn't have the answers there. They didn't just click. Like obviously I would have just, you know, still been in that, in that place, right? Um, but in college, I studied psychology. I have studied a lot of psychology. I've done personal transformation workshops that have like been borderline cults. So, Indy, I don't know. I don't know if I, you know, if I might always, you know, join yours. But you know, I'm very hesitant about. You know, I've just turned to so many different places, and you know, Buddhism, um, religion, uh, psychology, and now, and then, and then, I think the word mindfulness came up to me a, a way later. Not even from our people. Like I learned the yoga from from white people. And I think that was interesting too, to, to like learn about self-awareness from different cultures, different avenues. Um, but I think the commonality with all of this is that it does originate with spirituality. And with spirituality, I mean, you can look at any, any like, you know, school of thought in, in regards to that, and it'll always come back to this oneness that we have, mm. you know? And so you can't avoid that. Mindfulness is about getting in touch with yourself. But what are you using that for? Right. You know, what are you using that for? It's like, yes, getting in touch with yourself. And, 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 you know, we mindfulness, we can't have that conversation and yes, without mental health. I mean, I've suffered from depression. Um, I, I was born into depression. My mom actually had postpartum when I was born. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it's, I think it's, it, you know, getting in touch with yourself and, and healing is a big part of this conversation because if we talk about that oneness, I mean, yes, we're suffering in the inside and our world is suffering too. And I don't think that's a coincidence that that's the way it is. They're hand in hand. So if you're using mindfulness for healing, if you're using it with the intention of connection, that's where it's at. You know, it's all intentionality to me. Um, If it's just personal gain, because that's the thing, right? I mean, getting in touch with yourself is also going to help you get in touch with other people. And we can continue talking about that later on as well. I want to hear from everyone else too, but I think that, you know, that's where we get to, that's where we begin to use it to, you know, further ourselves. And along the way we can hurt people too. Um, so again, it's all intentions. It's all intentions. Really. Yeah. Indy, you want to add to that? Uh, I mean, Omkar like hit it on the, on the, on the mark right there. I mean, it's, it's intention such a big thing. I think uh, something that, you know, um, that has to be brought up as power, you know, like, you know, we, when we practice any sort of thing where it's developing our physical, our mental, our spiritual, if you don't want to believe in spiritual, whatever, our mental, our physical, <laughs> whatever power it is, when we cultivate power, there's also responsibility for that power, right? And so I feel like, and we see it, right? We see, we see it sometimes in gurus, right? You see Osho, there's that great show that was on Netflix, Wild, 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 what was it? Wild, Wild Country? I'm like, oh, yeah. So you see it, right? Power does this thing, right? Like when people get powerful, they might be giving you something great. They might be actually offering something amazing. But at some point, when that power doesn't have responsibility connected to it, it just, it, it just destroys everything, right? And it destroys lives and it destroys generations and it destroys possibilities and potentialities. And so with that being said, you know, um, 
I mean, I can, I can even answer the next thing, right? I think you're probably gonna ask me about where the mic comes from, right? Yeah. And mindfulness, I'll like yeah. jump into that just from that, right? Yeah, like the, these things that cultivate like mental power, like you have Headspace and Calm and all these multi-billion dollar million companies. You have these like Goop now, Goop or whatever that is, like the, with Gwyneth Paltrow. You have like, you have all these things, even ayahuasca and people are doing like mushroom and ayahuasca retreats and there's all these like, <laughs> these different spaces, right? But these things are all like cultivating mental and physical power and like even fitness, fitness, right. and regimen, the fit, right? they all go overboard sometimes when they don't have responsibility connected to them, right? What does it mean? If you're physically and mentally able, does that mean now you could do something else? Like, can you be involved in your community? Can you be politically involved? Because you have more resiliency? Can you like be involved in leadership spaces so you can make a difference in whatever space you're in? Um, can you be involved with the family? Because now you have more resiliency. You can actually like tolerate more. So you can maybe observe people more in a way, right? So like, that's kind of crazy that we kind of have lost that way, especially with mindfulness. It's kind of like, there's been this weird thing where it's like, great, more people are meditating, more people are doing yoga. But now what? Like, now what can we do with that power, right? So we don't turn into another Osho or more Oshos don't happen, right? How do we prevent Russell Simmons and all these different people who take advantage of getting attention because they're doing yoga, right? And there's the influencers, right? So like, what are you doing with your influence now? You got all a bunch of people watching you do yoga and meditate. What now? Like, that's great. But like, what can you do more for your community, for politics, maybe what? I mean, you know, you know in... For me, you know, make mindfulness where, where I can really define it is like your social responsibility, right? So like, mm -hmm. it's great to take care of your individual responsibility, but then what's the social? We're connected. So like, if you don't do the so connected part, you're not really practicing the whole thing. You're just practicing the McDonald's thing, or I'm just going to, I'm going to go to the, I'm going to go get fast food. I'm not going to make the food. I'm not going to watch myself make the food and be intentional with the food. I'm going to go get fast food and get it really fast. <laughs> and then I got it. <laughs> but like, what? That doesn't work with anything, right? So like, no, love, anything, anything we talk about, you can't do that, right? You have to let it simmer. Good stuff, you got to let it sit and simmer. Takes and a while. Like, Patience. Marinate. Yeah. Things got to marinate, you know? Um, but I, at the same time, I, I agree, it's, it's a wonderful time that people are connecting to this stuff. However, let's all not get too connected to either following somebody and not following our own self mm. and, or getting caught up in paying $9.99 a month to get meditation or mindfulness <laughs> like if you get caught in that loop right. then you're just a part of some sort of cult you're part of something right some mlm guru cult whatever i don't know right you gotta be careful yeah i completely agree with that people ask me uh, who do you follow and i say I, I don't follow anybody i listen to people's messages but i don't like you know i don't throw away my house and you know run to india and you know just sit at their feet i don't do that uh, dude i i tell i tell people that i follow them <laughs> like, I follow you. What are you doing? I was like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "Following you." <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I just want to thing um, with the uh, with, with with power. What you're saying, I think another thing is important, like uh, being an empath, right? I mean, there's no way that you can be mindful without developing your empathy. So you know, like ego is natural. You know, we're all human, and we all want to. Like, right, if you're suffering from depression, I mean, you're not a bad person for wanting to use all these tools for yourself, right? Like, you're bettering yourself, and that's going to help your family. It's going to create ripple positive effects as well. But the thing is, like, I've also noticed, like, there's a lot of things. I mean, you know, you mentioned ayahuasca. Like, there's, like, Reiki healing. There's so many different things that I'm not even aware of and comfortable with to, you know, enter. But I've also seen people that are comfortable with those things use it to, you know, to understand people and manipulate them. So... Yes you know us empaths we also have to understand like at, like you know as you grow and and you know people that are interested watching and, and us too that you know as we learn these tools it does come with power you know you're understanding people you're understanding people that yes like you know probably don't even understand what you meant by meditating on their food and you know being intentional about their cooking right like that's something i've had to i've been cooking my whole life but i'm finally taking the time to enjoy that process you know but it's like through that process it's very powerful yes working out with intentionality is very powerful and so even as we're on this journey to to remember that that hey like a like not everybody this is an easy work and also that this comes with power with understanding other people and how you use that again is very very key right and yeah. my, my, mind you too i it's like i i would love to get with you and shivali's ideas on this but like i also feel there's power also there needs to be some sort of like grace and like kindness that comes like that practice or understanding of gracefulness and kindness. I don't know, I can't like articulate it perfectly, but like maybe 
I don't know, like love and power. What do you guys, what do you guys feel about? Because you guys are women and I feel men always take up that power and they like gobble, 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 gobble it up in different places. But like, what do we need to do to balance it, right? And not just make money or build our egos. Yeah, the, there's like so much good stuff here. I wish I could just like re repeat it all. But when you're saying that, Indy, when you were talking about, you know, 100% agree that there's this responsibility and like, but most importantly, it's, you know, we can learn the meditation, we can sit by ourselves and continue to practice and practice and practice, but the real work happens the moment you are in relation with another, right? So our human existence happens in relation, whether that's in relation yeah. with the land, in relation with whatever, in with other humans, with animals, with whoever, within with ourselves, right? And we have these senses so that we can experience the world. And so with that, it's like, how are you taking this practice this work that you're doing of deeply understanding yourself and then taking it out into the world and that's where the the muck in the, in the muck mindfulness and even what you were saying about fast food sure you can get that fast food but you're not actually like nourishing your body and then you end up with x amount of problems obesity diabetes all of this stuff because your body's not being nourished the same thing you do, okay, I checked the box. I did my five minute of meditation today. I'm a great human being. I think in psychology, they, there's something called moral licensing. Like, oh, I'm doing this, that's good. Now I can go and like be a jerk in this other way, right? Because we just are, trick ourselves to thinking that we've, you know, we're doing that one good thing. So then, and you don't, and, and it's subconscious. It doesn't always happen. It's not happening intentionally, but that's where the true practice comes into, like I said earlier, catching yourself, right? Like developing that awareness, slowing down um, and recognizing like where, when the ego's at play and when it's like your like higher consciousness at play. Yeah. Um, Shafala, you want to add something? Indy asked you a question about the grace. Yeah, I I did have something to, oh, right, okay, I, it's back. I was like, oh my goodness, I get so into the conversation sometimes where I'm just listening. But um, So in my classes that I teach meditation and yoga, I often, sorry, the sun is setting and I can't, it's like. It's beautiful, I, it's, it's beautiful. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> um, right there, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, in my classes that I teach for yoga and meditation, especially lately as yoga studios are slowly starting to open up in California, I'm emphasizing it even more these days, but I'm talking about how like we do these practices to become a beacon of light. And it's like for yourself, but then you, I, I remind my students all the time, like go out and be a beacon of light in your community now. You're the one that's coming here to find your center, to to find your peace within and now like it's microcosm macrocosm and before you get to the ultimate macrocosm of the universe it's like start with your communities around you you know what you're practicing what you're what you're getting from that so you know there there may be people in your community that are still victims to a lack of awareness mm -hmm. and they're just on autopilot and they're really struggling and um you know it's it's not easy to change those people sometimes but how do you embody being a beacon of light how do you embody compassion understanding you know and and just by doing that it's like you start to get people i, I mean i've been doing this stuff for years and my family members kind of like you know 20 years ago yoga they're like okay you know but now they're all like slowly coming in like you know you're always so at peace well not always like i i work at it but i've come a long way <laughs> I've, been, I've, been I've, I've been talking about mushrooms with my aunties and uncles lately. So. Whoa, you're on a different level, man. <laughs> How are they responding to that? Actually, you know, because there's so much research, I'm able to speak with so much confidence and be like, well, well look at the research and check nice. this out. I'm like, pull up on my phone. I'm like, look at this. It's helping with PTSD and trauma and stress. And they're like, oh, 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 There's like curiosity and fear, but back and forth, you know? Shafali, you know that your uh, what you've talked about kind of reminds me of this um, it's, uh, of the guy of two kinds of people: one who uses mindfulness, goes into the cave, uses meditation, and just stays in the cave after he's completely transformed, and, and it's the other person who comes back into life after the transformation and you know rolls up his sleeves and gets to work. On oh my God, D dude. Varun, Varun, Onkar, Onkar, do you remember the story of Guru Nanak when he went up to the, like the mountains? 
and like the ascetics were like meditating. Do you know that story? So there's a very famous story of like Guru Nanak back in the 1500s. He like goes like like up to like you know the uh, Kashmir over there, and uh -huh. there's like these pundits, and they're med they're all like meditating in the caves. Uh -huh. And he goes up to them, like challenges them, and he's like, "Yo, bro, you guys are like freaking masters and dope, but there's people down there suffering. Like, yeah. like hey, there's like people suffering. You guys are up here. What the what the what the?" And he like sang a song to them. But you remember that Onkar? Yeah, that's where the term of like Sant Sabai, like saint soldier, comes from, right? Like you can't just be you know, doing hashish in the woods and like, you know, just, you know, getting in touch with yourself. Like you have to go and apply it to the real world as well. Yeah, yeah, that, I love, I love that. that, that did, right? so yeah, that's what the Buddha did. Like he reached enlightenment at his young age and then spent the remainder of his life just being there and like sharing that as a gift with anyone and everyone that would come. And um, there was a story, they share a lot of stories about him in Vipassana and one was, you know, like someone, he would have all these people and they'd sit there and he'd be sharing the teaching. And then uh, this one story is like a priest, like a Hindu priest comes and he's pissed off. Like you're basically taking all of our people. They're all coming here and sitting with you when they should be home doing their puja bhat. And um, he's yelling all these insults and everything. And the Buddha is just sitting there. And then he goes, let me ask you a question. Uh, you know, what would, if somebody came to your house, like, what would you, what would you say? And they brought you a gift. What would you say? And then the guy would say, well, you know, he's all confused. Like, why is he sharing? Why is he asking this? And he would say, well, well, then I would invite him in and, you know, accept the gift. And then he's like, but like, what if he comes with a gift of insults? What would you do? And then he's like, well, I wouldn't even let him in. I'd tell him to leave. And he's like, that's what I'm saying. You've come to my house. <laughs> These gifts of insults, I don't want them. You just take them back with you. <laughs> but he like, was so calm. It's not like he reacted, right? right? Like that was his practice. And the guy was just so struck by that that he then sat down. He's like, teach me what, how did you just do that, right? Like oh, teach me. That's power. How did you not react? That is power, right? How did you not react to all this stuff that I was yelling at you? Because that's that's what we think is power like if i can speak louder if i can speak stronger if i can like use aggression and these insults like i somehow am having power but the true power is when the person just doesn't react to it right, right. and instead they accept them with grace and love and just say hey come sit down well, Ritu, I would love to add something because I've, I've come across something in the past year or so um, that's really changed how I approach a lot of stuff. It's nonviolent communication. Yeah. And like kind of using Buddhism and yoga philosophy and like to understand non, like not just nonviolent communication with other people, but with myself. Like it starts within. We have so much negative talk. Think about all the suicides that Indians, like South Asians go through. A lot of it's because of so much negative self-talk. Right. And like we kind of get programmed with that growing up, seeing our parents and our lo loved ones doing it. And then we do it. And then like it becomes a cycle and then we push it on other people. Then we start projecting violent communication on mm -hmm. other people. And right. Mm -hmm. So I like I think that's something I wish our community practice more. Maybe we could maybe in this conversation, we could maybe advocate for that more in our community. Like a part of challenging the suicides and mental health is like non -viol getting rid of, you know, violent communication with ourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. So Does how do we do that? Does, does anybody practice you know anything about NBC? I do. I have a book here. One of these is about nonviolent communication, and I've read it, and I practice it, and it's a practice, you know, and it does start with the self. It's like having um, compassion and loving, like, dialogue with yourself, and then that resonates outwards mm -hmm. to other people. And mindfulness is a way to understand how you're being violent to yourself, so you can transform that to nonviolent. And crazy because it's so ingrained right like the whole like as much as I grew up kind of resisting the culture and um rebelling against it and you know the whole like lokiki genge like lokia genge like god the amount of times I heard that damn phrase uh -huh. and it's like I don't care what people think I don't care what people think and sure I kept saying that out loud but the brainwashing was still happening inside where I catch myself sometimes. Like, kind of went the I went the extreme way, guys. Like, and now I'm like, I, look at me, everybody, look at me. Yeah, Come on. Exactly. <laughs> look, That's look, I can get deco, deco, sublog, deco. Yeah, it's not easy. I mean, and I think part of that journey is to recognize, like, for me especially, like, to like, I've been really hard on myself. Like, why is it so hard to be positive and encouraging to myself? especially in these lines of work like oh you guys have all said you guys are you know i mean you've like 
PhD in engineering, you know, like I, I myself passed up law school, indie passed up, you know, med school. It's like, why'd you do that? Why'd you do that? You know, and it's a, uh, it can be very damaging, but to also, very, you know, it's important to recognize like how deep these wounds run too, you know, I mean, you know, when, they, when we talk about generational trauma, it's all very tied. And so be very committed. I mean, it's not easy. Um, I, we need more of it. We need more positivity and encouragement with one another. Um, and that's, that's like, you know, if that's not a reason to get in this work, I don't know what it is. Yeah. Hey, Onkar, I want to take that conversation of mindfulness. And you mentioned earlier in mindfulness in corporate America and how you got burnt out by it. So how is mindfulness currently being, in a way, utilized as a tool in corporate America? And what have you seen? What is your experience around that? Yeah. So on the one side, I do want to say that, you know, it's inevitable that East and West is going to meet, you know, like this is going to happen. People are going to make money off of this industry. And, you know, I, I just think it's like, it's just a matter of like who is doing it and what are their intentions behind it? You know, what are they doing with this power? Um, but, you know, I think Rita, you were saying with, with your story about the Buddha, um, you know, the reason he sat down was because he wanted to learn, wow, like how did you not get emotionally bothered by that, right? Now that sound, that's, that's what it is. You know, it's very learning, learning that it, even in corporate America, what I've seen is, um, especially in my time in New York, I spent three and a half years there and really building my business there. And what I saw was just, you know, I mean, it's the culture there, but it's, it's everywhere really. Um, but using that specifically, like, so, okay, I, I'm already, I'm already say a mother and I'm, I have a job now I've got kids on the way, just like wanting to add more to that day. Right. Like there's like this incentive to, to be more invincible. You know, like, so how do I, how do I, you know, it's all about you, right? I mean, in getting ahead. Um, and so when we kind of just stay, well, that's what I've really seen a lot of, and with, with a, whether it's with companies, whether it's with the individual, I mean, with companies, it's a little, it really crushes me. What I've seen is, um, you know, let's, let's squeeze in, let's bring in someone like one of us into, you know, at noon at like, you know, lunchtime to teach mindfulness um, so that we can get our employees more productive at the end of the day. You know, like, is that really the goal here? And so, again, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit disheartened from my experiences just seeing, like, how much the kind of angle has been about getting ahead, uh, whereas we really should be working on healing. I mean, us brown people, I mean, you know, the, there's stats out saying that, you know, we're some of the socioeconomically, like, most successful people in America. Um, but that's because, like, you know, I feel like there's, like, just, like, one half of, us, half of us that we operate, you know, just getting ahead, getting ahead. And, uh, but we don't take the time to express ourselves. I mean, that's why we're not really in these spaces. We're not in the healing spaces. We're not in the spaces that don't require structure and systems and, and, and all of the, and, and, and I guess just the security too. Um, but I, I really think there's like so much untapped beauty um, in this space if we just do it right with the right intentions. Um, unfortunately, I don't think I've seen much of that. Um, I, I actually do want to share a story um, I, um, you know, New York requires a lot of networking. I, I remember I went to this, um, it's really funny actually. It's like this <laughs> breakfast. It was like breakfast um, for people like, you know, in the mindfulness space to learn from one another. So I'm sitting there, a um, lot, of, lot of guys, um, and, and I, I should mention that they're white because I, I felt like I wasn't very welcome. Um, and so I, we're having this conversation. They're trying to learn, um, you know, what it is that I do. I'm telling them about my one-on-one -on -one mindset coaching that I do. And they're trying to give me some, you know, I guess like business advice. Um, so one of them tells me he's starting a, he has a life coaching company. So where they train coaches and then, so it's like all systemized, systematic, you know, they, it's not like, you know, just one person with their ideology kind of helping, which is what we really see. Um, I mean, I'm one of them. I'm like independent. I didn't like, there's no school of like life coaching that I went to, you know? Um, but, but the way he was talking, it was, um, it was, I mean, it's nice to, you know, have things like systemized, but um, I, began, I began asking him, like, you know, so like, you know, what do you guys help your clients with? Like, you know, you talk about helping them with life hacks, you know, and, and it was just funny because, um, again, it's that East and West, right? Like in, in, on my Eastern side of me, I mean, helping other people, um, you know, finding inner peace, that, that's like very natural. That's the things I want to talk about when I, when I talk to people in relation, right? But this guy over here was like, you know, yeah, we give people like life hacks. And, you know, like the first couple of times, you know, we spend, you know, just doing a discovery period. It was like these like consulting terms that you're using to, you know, to help people with, 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 their, with their issues, right? And then he's like, yeah, so, you know, we give them like sleep life hacks, like, like put a pillow between your knees. 
I'm like, man, people are paying you like top dollar to tell them to put a knee between, you know, like put a pillow between their knees, you know? I'm like, I would just tell someone that, you know? And so I think like that, again, the intentionality that like, just like the mindset behind it, like, you know, like trying to like squeeze every dollar out of, out of this while we do it. Um, that just, you know, doesn't sit well with me. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I really wish, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, it, it's like inevitable in, in a lot of ways, you know, corporate America. So it's like, why would we not just- I don't know, Onkar, I don't think it's inevitable. I think there is, there's something lacking in a lot of spaces, especially the corporate world. And like, for me, like whenever I've done corporate stuff, I've noticed that like, there's a lack of heart. Like, you know, mm-hmm. I, I see a lot of intellect, right? Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of intellect, right? Sometimes there's a lot of sexuality too, like, or hypersexuality showing up within that intellect. But there's like no, not the heart centered stuff, right? The heart chakra, whatever you want to be spiritual about it, or if you want to talk about just doing heart stuff, like things, compassion, empathy, pra- that kind of practice, the practice mm-hmm. of empathy, the practice of is not, like, pra- it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's non-existent. It's not even, it's not even existent in hospitals. Forget about like in a corporate environment, right? And so, um, so, so that being said, ever, do they ever up? have some sort of training for this in the corporate other than these programs that we are putting together? And, and there's a catch-22. I don't know, Ritu and, and Shafal, you guys have met a lot of people. And so, Onkar, like even the people who, pra- like, cor- people who are mindfulness practitioners, even they lack the, the heart-centered approach, mm-hmm. right? Like, that's the problem, right? So if, they're, if the blind are teaching the blind, what do you think is going to happen? So they're hiring these, like, multi-million, there's a, hiring, like, Anthony Robbins to come in teach meditation, I think that Rob is not coming from his heart, you know? Deepak Chopra, I mean, I, I love the guy, bless him for, you know, he's not really coming from the heart heart, it's much more from here. So, you know, like it's more, it's interesting that we need to have more leaders in the mindfulness space to bring heart-centered mindfulness to, that's at least my perspective and even the work I've done in corporate environments is like make, getting people to laugh. Like, holy shit, that's the only thing I've been, I feel like I actually took a step back, Onkar, a couple of years ago, I was like trying to do meditation and stuff in corporate and then like I noticed that they just don't even know how to laugh. Like yeah. people don't know how to laugh anymore. Like forget about like doing anything else. <laughs> like just laugh a little bit, you know? And and, yeah. like, and from there I noticed that like they connect more. I've actually had companies call me back and say, oh, they had meetings and people were way more open and they talked about stuff. I'm like, holy shit, just laughing and enjoying yourself. That's like missing, right? People are, people are miserable everywhere. So that's laughter yeah. yoga. <laughs> Nice. I want to I want to add to that and just maybe just point out like our corporate systems, all our systems, the structures, our capitalist society here, it's built on a masculine structure. So as you're talking about this like heart-based practice coming into a masculine entity, what I think is really lacking is not just possibly like some heart, but really the vulnerability right? Like a masculine structure is like the power and oh gosh, we can't show our vulnerable side and like be sensitive or empathic or compassionate. And if you think about the majority of corporations are led by men and not to say the men cannot be there, but they just, they've been trained to not tap into that side. So it's, it's a, it's a root at the root cause. Like it's a systemic problem that started from a very, very young age and it's continuing on. And I think, you know, interjecting ourselves in the, the, with the youth is a great starting point and working both from top down, bottom up, but even in the corporate structures, like really teaching the vulnerability, like having people, and I don't know what, what or how, like really to get people to open up to that, but because it's such deep wounds, right? Like right. we've been doing this work for a long time and we're still, I know I'm still every day is like, I'm riding those waves, right? Some days I'm like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I got this. And other days it's like, gosh, I'm the mindfulness person. And so, and we've been doing this work. So imagine folks that haven't ever done it. And they have these deep wounds that they've never even addressed. So there is a lot there to tackle. And all when I work with corporations, and I've done you know workplace wellness work for a long time. Um, I actually taught when you're talking about laughter yoga, like t- almost ten years ago. Um, I was on the wellness team, and we actually ha- were supposed to do. There was a big, huge con- leadership conference, and they have like the team that does the whatever any type of team building exercise they're like we want laughter yoga 
And my boss was like, well, I, someone on my team teaches it because I teach you all after yoga. And she's like, you can do it. You, you know, will you do it? I'm like, I'm going to stand on stage in front of all of these suited and booted people and teach laughter yoga. <laughs> all right. um, I had no idea how they were going to respond and react to it. And I did it. And, you know, I had them do like the ha, 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 ho, 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 and like, do different exercises and I was they at first they were like this is weird but then they got into it and just to have that laughter was amazing it just set the tone for the rest of yeah. that conference um so doing practices like that but how do we weave them into the day-to-day -day? like this is the question that I keep asking in the problem I'm trying to solve is rather than having somebody that comes in and it's like 12 p.m on Wednesday you're doing your 30 minute guided meditation Rather than that, it's like, how do you weave it in day to day? Every meeting, like someone says, let's start with a moment of mindfulness. And I've talked to managers and leaders and, you know, the ones that want to do it, there's still this resistance because they, they feel fear. Like, what if, what are people going to say when I, as a leader teach, like start my meeting with, okay, we're all going to take a deep breath, right? They already feel uncomfortable themselves doing it. And then they have the team that, again, it comes to that vulnerability. Like if I do that, will I be safe still? Will I, you know, still, how can I hold my power as a leader for this team and show my vulnerability? Like how do those coexist? And it doesn't take 30 minutes. It could just be that one minute, but if we can get to that place, we can at least begin to, I think, crack the code on this. Feminine energy. That's what we need. That's what we need. Yeah, yeah. I feel like there's too much masculine going on, and now it, uh, the feminine needs to balance it out. And, and, and I would say we, we don't want too much feminine either. I think there needs to be balance. a dance, you know? Like, <laughs> to go back and forth, because, you know, balance. either one too much is not, is going to... Right. right. I'd love to hear Shafali's thoughts on this. Yes. Uh, to add to it, there's, like, a couple things. One is um, that I talk about it, this in my book, The Should Life, and I think it's the one that, you know, a lot of people who are maybe working in corporate America kind of feel, right? Like they're doing what they thought they should be doing. Like it's respectable that, you know, that financial success is important, stability is important, rather than really questioning, um, you know, what are my passions? What are my desires? Like what, minus all the voices of influence, right? Like my truest passions and desires, how do I tap into that? And I think that it's definitely a byproduct of, you know, mindfulness to really get deep into, like, what are those for um, those who practice? So it's like, if you're really not in this space of, of mindfulness practice, you kind of sometimes get hooked into this should life, which does cultivate not only um, not questioning your passions, your desires, but also uh, that um, kind of stoicism of like you know um not not being in your fluidity the femininity not being in like the things that light you up um and and kind of just like feeling like maybe something's missing but not having the tools to like tap into like okay well what is it that's really you know just not not cutting it for me um, but on the flip side, I see, like, I'm part of some um, independent business groups. I, I independently own my skincare line. Um, and, like, for example, I'm part of an organization called uh, Indie Beauty Group. And um, I... Uh, oh. <laughs> 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 <We're up late. laughs> uh, so in there, I meet so... I go to the conferences and, and like, I'll meet so many passionate entrepreneurs who are um, really leading um, uh, conscious companies. I'm seeing a rise in conscious companies and it's coming from passion driven um, people uh, or teams that uh, really value things like transparency, for example, and giving back and community and uh, authenticity versus, okay, what's the best way to make, you know, the biggest profit. It's the, it's so kind of icky, you know, like I, I haven't been in that world for a long time, even though I've had my own business. Again, it's been independent. It's been so maybe even overly heart centered in the beginning. It was like completely a passion project when I finally kind of 
when I let go of the should of what I needed to look at as a businesswoman is when it started to thrive. I was stepping into my authenticity. Nice background there. Um, so, yeah. And um, so, like, I guess I'm seeing two things, like, you know, people who are kind of stuck in the should life, but also a rise in um, conscious companies through people who are tapping into their passions they did maybe there was a turning point because of you know really getting into yoga then getting deeper into that you know mindfulness the meditation what, whatever the path was coming to the deepest parts of oneself mm -hmm. so that we can serve our communities when we tap into our passions our strengths we first of all inspire others to do the same we um, can encourage them we can be th this is all that I, I was referring to in that like beacons of light you know not just that compassion but also inspiration motivation because like you're happy when somebody's living their passions they're happy what why not spread that you know i live for when i'm having a conversation with somebody when i see like the spark in their eyes of like what excites them i'm like that's what you've got that's to be good. doing yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah it took a long time for me to find that spark in my eye like figuring out what that passion that purpose is because i was just so in that should life, you know, I was shooting, I, I should all over myself. Wait, can you, wait, can you put, can you pull your eye up to this, to the camera? I want to see it. Oh my God, oh my God, it's so bright. Oh <laughs> I think we need uh, to train our optometrists to look for that. <laughs> oh, that was amazing. <laughs> um, uh, I, I mean, I, I would love to like throw something in there. Uh, Varun, like, I don't, uh, obviously you have this thing going on with what's, what's the story and you have like, a, you have a program, you've been doing something. I'm just throwing this out there. It's not on you. Maybe somebody else takes this initiative or maybe you can be a part of this, but it'd be nice to like do some sort of like think tanking or something where we can like, like start creating a community and especially South Asian community that supports each other and then bring in aunties and uncles. And, you know, we have a doctor on here. Dr. River Raj is here. Like we need to create community that supports each other. Like not like hates doesn't like go like, Oh, your idea sucks or like whatever. But like, actually it's like, Hey, how can we support? We can, we can invest in it and make it a cooperative business yes. or we can like whatever you want like let's create because there's all these doctors and lawyers and people business we have money but right. we don't really have money yeah. <laughs> yeah. well and then like kind of on the flip side of that like maybe that's like coming from that more masculine side of like let's support one another from this you know business and then like from the feminine side like support one another i think you were talking about this and you or someone else was like around brown people and we we you know, we were maybe taught from other like white teachers and we didn't really, we couldn't really be open with our thoughts and expressions and emotions. We still maybe can't it, with other brown people and even our aunties and uncles, like there's sometimes you sit with them and you're like, God, there's so much deep pain there. And I just want you to be able to talk about it. And sometimes they don't know the words or like, mm -hmm. again, you get stuck in the, if I share this, like, what are people going to think of me? I have this mask to uphold right so like creating this support for we can talk about these stuff right like we in a way like you can have your support system and like your coaching and therapy and everything with one another and being able to share and express those deep, deep feelings and once they're out it's like a clearing right it's not even like being having to get advice it's just getting it out like it's stuck in the body and so having the opportunity, um, that safe space to get that stuff out with people who understand, right? Like you go to like a white therapist and you're like, yeah, uh, well, my, you know, culture, this is that, my parents want me to get married. And they're like, but you're, you're an adult, you have your own life. Like, well, you can do what you want. I was like, oh God, yeah. you don't get it, you know? Oh like you God. don't get like a oh, sure. lot. I've literally had to educate my yeah, therapist about my culture. They're, they're sitting there fascinated about it. Oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no, this isn't interesting. I'm fucking, I'm sorry, I'm hurting. You know? <laughs> hey, I yeah. saw a therapist for many years when I lived in New York and I seeked one that was Indian so that I, I felt like, you know, I wouldn't have to explain so much about, you know, the background and uh, it was helpful because there, she did understand certain norms and challenges. But yeah, that's, I, w I would love to create a community yeah. to support our, mm. you know, our, our our fellow kind of brothers sisters aunties uncles i mean especially aunties and uncles because i think that their generation it was just so um was unacceptable to um express how you really feel you know and also like um there's 
I have seen in my own family on both my mother and father's side, like um, mental health issues that were never openly talked about. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, it's, it's, it helps us. Like when I had my own challenges of like, well, is it coming from, you know, is there something maybe genetically that I'm prone to? And then like, there's really clear signs of some extreme behaviors. And um, it, it, when you start to talk about it, like I've tried to, I've done courses with Landmark. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Landmark. I no, I don't want to sign up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of people who have a lot of strong opinions about it. it's a self development, you know, educational system. Some people like to refer to it as a cult. Um, think that there are, um, you know, practices I don't agree with in Landmark where they uh, promote like you to push their programs on others, like um, pretty hardcore. However, I have really um, gained so much from them from doing their whole like curriculum for living. And um, I wanted my parents to get involved because I just saw so, so many patterns that I kind of undid. This really complemented the spiritual practice, the mindfulness. It, there was like, you know, um, it's just another form of like understanding. And um, I, I found that it was a little challenging because of the cultural difference for them to fully integrate, but it doesn't mean that, you know, our parents, aunties, uncles couldn't use support and it creates like pretty deep healing because it is generational. It is, it, it's cultural. There's so much in you know, beauty in our history and our lineage, but there's also a lot of suffering and pain that we can kind of be the beacons of light to stop to heal the future but also like you know the ones who are living but are from you know the past yeah as you know the the elders really i like to always say i like to always say that you know our parents i I noticed my older brother too is like this they're they're the no generation like i always joke because like you like do anything you you offer anything it could be like gold and they're like no you're like can you try this out no and they're like don't even list like it's like wait you gotta even explain it and like no I'm like, what? Like, so like, and like, not just them. I noticed it like with politics and like the boomer generation, they're like all about no. Like they just, everything is no first and then maybe they might do it later, you know? Yeah. And you know, so Indy, Ritu and Shafal, you guys bring up a great point. And this is what that creative is about. Like right here, that's what we're creating. Us having these conversations is empowering South Asian uncles and aunties, especially to, uh, you know, to open up and talk about their feelings because you know, when they first moved here in the 80s and the 70s, 80s, 90s, they were focused on building their wealth. They were focused on being that model minority where they didn't want to portray an image of weakness. So they hid everything behind all of the, the masks that, you know, Indy was wearing earlier. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I feel like that's now it's time that we, us, our generation, stand up and talk about these things. The, so. So it makes it easier for our past, our elders to talk about them as well. Yeah. And even like beyond that, like, you know, especially again, like for the women, like so many were in of our parents um, and their generation, like having arranged marriages, right? Like you see this person one time, you're married, like you had no choice in the matter. Like so many um, people didn't have like really choice in like how they wanted to live their life. And I can't, the amount of suffering or suppression that, creates and then it just keeps getting pushed down right and like when emotions come up it's like oh i just i just don't want to like cry or like have these emotions so then you just keep pushing them away pushing them away but it's palpable and it's affecting our um like our people like our culture our generations and it is something that yeah that would be amazing if we could have a support group a community for everyone and like even close the gap of of communication between the generations, right? Like, um, whether if it's a language gap or just like you know, having to, and sometimes that's not even with words, it's just being in with mm-hmm. one another. But we're going to change that sugar, no, that fake sugar, no white sugar. Okay, we're going to do actually good. Honey, put good in there. Right. Oh, good. Okay, there we go. No cocaine. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. So talking about cocaine, Indy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the segue. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> What's the connection between mindfulness and war? Oh, wow, damn. Um, whoa. First of all, I was gonna say something about the cocaine thing. I have a yeah. new addiction. 
my addiction these days, what I've been snorting is uh, hope. I've been snorting hope. Ooh, so if you that. guys want some of that, let me know. Because I've been snorting every day, every morning, night, everything. I'm sharing it with people. So just let me know. You have an abundance of hope, huh? <laughs> abundance of hope. I got, I got a lot. It's infinite, <laughs> actually. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, it's interesting because, you know, there's two aspects of this, right? First of all, the military really loves the idea that mindfulness is great for, like, focus, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, that whole idea of, like, hey, you improve focus, improve production, right? Um, people are more resilient, right? So then, you know, not just you get the corporate environment. I mean, there is a mili military industrial corporate co complex, I've heard of that, right? I'm, uh, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but there's something going on there, right, with the military industrial complex. So corporations and military connected um, inexplicably, inexplicably. Um, and so what's interesting is they're, they're now starting to incorporate mindfulness into the military a lot. But once again, like we were talking with you about it, like the heart center, the purpose, the responsibility of it, like what is it? Those are not being brought into it. The heart center, the feminine balance is not being brought into it. So it's like, once again, it's getting like, it's getting co-adopted, um, appropriated, um, and almost like in a way, like to me, cause like this is like mystical, powerful, mystical stuff too. Like, I feel like it's getting raped, right? Like I feel spirituality is getting raped. Mindfulness is getting raped by those who are trying to take advantage so they can kill people better or they can like, I take advantage of people better. It's like, whoa, like, no, like, that's like the complete opposite of what the intention is, right? So it's like improving the performance on the war field, improving, you know, creating better soldiers is essentially that's what's happening. But, 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 but let me answer that with this. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but what's missing is that we forgot, and you, by the way, I think Onkar, you can probably attest to this. We know soldiers are coming back with PTSD. When they kill people, they have crazy PTSD. When Officers kill people. I have friends who are officers who've, who've had to kill people for, for work. They actually had to do it because something was bad happening and they have PTSD. We don't help them. Like they, they, they might be teach them mindfulness, right? But they don't really, they're not dealing with what's going on as, with the warriorship. And you know, Onkar, we, we, we get trained with the warrior saint, the Jedi. Like, like, yeah, learn meditation, be like a samurai, right? Like if you are gonna be wielding weapons and like be a guardian and be a protector, you should also have this connection to art and humanities mm -hmm. and like love, right? Like, so that- And healing yeah. and vulnerability. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, not only is it that, not only do we not support soldiers and police officers, if anything, I mean, I've heard plenty of police officers say they they don't seek help because they'll lose their job because of it that's terrible and i mean it's really heartbreaking rita when you mentioned with uh corporate america too that you know people don't feel like they can be vulnerable i mean it's it's a threat to their authority i mean say it's a leader that's that that you know or someone just needs to take space um so this is where it's it's very harmful if anything and we talk about intentions too right i mean like we want to create better soldiers but well, we don't want to take care of them when they come back home mm. you know so let's kind of keep it keep that same energy but yeah it's it's um again it's that intention of how can we use it to move ahead but then it's it's uh, I mean, maybe it is maybe, maybe it's just you know too many men leading the front right it's like that masculine part of it without the other side you know and, and i do have to admit i've done some work with the police and i it, it was there was an art to it, like to get them to be open with me. I'm a, and I'm a dude, right? If a girl went into that space, there's no way they would have gotten vulnerable. I did. But it, yeah. it did. And I'll share my story after you like, share yours. But you're a badass, Ritu. Like, <laughs> like, you know, you know, like it's, it's, it's a, there is an art, like not everybody can just do it, right? Like there's like this way that you have to connect with people, especially with your, the police, the military, you're in the prisons. There's, there's gotta, we, and then also, I mind you, like we have to create the space for people, more people to be able to do it, right? I feel like a lot of people feel like they need to make money when they get a mindfulness and they don't like go like, oh wait, there's all these people who are really suffering. I might not make money or maybe I can make money, but I need to get it from the government or nonprofits or like some sort of initiatives. I mean, I don't know. We need to be a little bit more progressive with how we're addressing these issues in our community that are actually putting us in danger at this point, right? So. Yeah, and I think for mindfulness folks that are in, working with some of these communities, leaders, police officers, like we, it really like, we have to nourish ourselves too because it does take a lot of resilience, right? Like when I did go into a work with one of the uh, local police officers and they all just kind of laughed, like I would start teaching and they kind of laughed and they're like, this is bullshit. Like, you know, oh, we're supposed to meditate. And they had all these jokes and yeah, a part of me is like, 
should I be doing this? Like, I don't know. And, but I just showed up again and showed up again. And you know what? I got a message. I think it was a, like a year later after that. And it was an email. And it was one of the police officers who said that taking my course got him to start doing this. And it was just like, okay, let's do this five minute process. He started practicing it. And then like after the course ended, he actually went and sought out like a local like Buddhist center, started practicing there, enrolled in another course. And it's a big part of his you know, daily practice now. That's one person, but that one person changing and adopting that mindset now affects like all the people that he has to work with around him, but also like the civilians that he works with, right? So it, it, it can work and people are like open to it. They, again, it comes down to the vulnerability and it takes but, but, time. But Ritu, but Ritu, then you need like a massage and you need like a, some spa day for that. Like, you know, so we need to like balance it out. Cause that's like, you have to, you have to absorb that challenge and, and the self, yeah. you know? Well, then we need, like, I need that support system, right? Like other people that understand like, Hey, this is real work. And you know, again, South Asian, Oh, what do you do? You teach meditation, you teach yoga. Like it's not like a job. It's tough. It is not easy to show up for people in this way. And like, it takes a lot of energy. And um, I don't think, you know, it's, it's at least our community. I don't know if they really get that and like have that respect to, to it. Well, hey. yeah, I think it's a disconnection between themselves and, and the work too. I mean, I mean, I, I grew up like, you know, like, you know, yes, uh, Indy was saying that it's like a generation of no. I mean, you know, we'd go to like the like the water park or roller coaster, anywhere that had to do with fun. It's like, oh, what's this? Like, what's the point of this? You know, that's that attitude. And it's just like, there's no, it, it, they're not in touch with it. It's again, like, you know, just having to constantly think about surviving and winning. And I mean, I hope we can change that. I really do. Because I mean, this isn't just about our parents, you know, aunties and uncles generation. It's like, if, if our generation doesn't like see that and do the work like we are, you know, it just gets passed on. I mean, I have plenty of friends that have made those same choices that my parents have. It's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like this, you know, you walk outside and you see, you see trees and someone who is so um, uh, like mind centered, they're like, what's the purpose of this? Right. Where's the beauty in this? Like, what's why is the tree over here? But then someone who's heart centered is like, look at the beauty right here. The single tree nourishes so much life. Right. And flowers and all of that doesn't make sense anymore for someone who's so mind focused. And I think I was there at one point, too, in my life. I was so mind focused that I didn't really you know, care about the, the flowers and the trees. It, it was, hey, what's the purpose of it in my life? It doesn't enrich my life any, anyway. Um, so, Indy, I want to ask you a little bit. Maybe it's a little bit off topic. I'm not sure. But what does your shirt say? I love it. Oh, Deg uh, Deg Fateh, right? which basically translates to, I guess the best way to translate that is charity. Um, I guess gallantry, gallantry. And thick, fate, fate is like victory, right? But like, it, it kind of like comes back to like that. This, this, the essence of that saying is more like connected to like the idea of being like a, a Jedi, like a warrior saint, right? That like cultivating, cultivating like this, um, this like, this like type of like, like see the thing with a Jedi, right? Is a Je you know when a Jedi shows up. Like it's not, the Jedis are not supposed to be hidden, right? They're like show up and you're like, oh shoot, there's a Jedi. We got, all gotta be good now, right? And like for like Sikhs, that's a very important like mytho mythology, right? They're like, hey, somebody's gotta be that representation that when that person shows up, everybody's gotta be their best version of mm -hmm. themselves, right? And including themselves, right? Like, and so, be, and also being of service, right? And being a protector and being also a cultivator of humanities. And so basically this saying is kind of like the slogan of that, that vibration, the Khalsa, the warrior saint, mm -hmm. you know? And so for me, that's, that, that has like, you know, with everything going on, even right now with this pandemic, like that's been my saving grace is like being so connected to this mythology. I'm like, I'm, I'm ready. I'm going right now, guys. Like, I'm like, what this challenge that everybody's been facing, I'm like, let's fix this thing. This is why we have this going on because we got to make it awesome now. Right. And that, that mythology helps me. It gives me like a, it gives me like a framework to like uh, to like show up every day for myself and others. Absolutely. So that's beautiful. That's beautiful. I love that. I love that. Yeah, that's that's such a strong phrase to go by every day. Waking up to that that kind of vibration. That's beautiful, man. Thank you so much for sharing that, bro. Um, you know, I wanted to ask about mindfulness and our. So should mindfulness, there have been oppositions to the book, Make Mindfulness, wherein they say that mindfulness should not be used for social revolution, 
right? It should stop at the personal level. So what, what is your, what is your, your take on that? Like, should mindfulness be used to get to social revolution or should it just stop at the personal level? Ritu? The first thought that comes to my mind is if it's at the personal level, how could it not be at the social level, right? Like we are all interconnected and ultimately like it has to be at the personal level first and foremost, even if it stops at the personal level, it will become this at the social level, unless we all just like, go hide out in our own cave somewhere. And I don't know if there's, you know, 7 billion caves around maybe, but you know, we are social beings. So it's bound to be at the social level and yeah. Shafali, you wanna add something? Yeah, I don't think they can be separated. I think yeah. that as we work on the macrocosm, yeah. it's reflected in the macrocosm, again, in our immediate communities and then beyond. So I think it's a difficult argument to, separate right so onkar what can we do what in the corporate environment what can we do to take it from make mindfulness to mindfulness where there is some sort of change within that corporate structure maybe it's a system that's creating the stress that's you know adding to all of the the reasons that we need mindfulness in the first place what can we you know what can we do at the corporate level to add that mindfulness to it yeah so I would say, I mean, based on the previous question, I mean, the fact that what you guys have said too, they're not disconnected. It is, you know, together. We can't look at one without the other. <clears throat> I mean, I think everybody in corporate America needs to be mindful with starting with themselves, right? So it starts with you and, you know, I mean, even if we look at the current, like, you know, just if we look at the, if we want to call the civil rights movement going on right now, systemic change that the conversations that are happening around that, um, around a lot of that comes from certain people having too much power and again it's just too much masculine energy I mean <clears throat> we're having conversations not just about Black Lives Matter and anti-black racism but we're talking about how that ties into class struggles how that ties into capitalism <clears throat> especially during the pandemic when you know you're still having billionaires growing in wealth and everyone else is suffering so yeah it, like you know one person's pain doesn't end with theirs I mean it's we're all connected and so we need to, we need to, like, it's, it's a necessity to me, really. I mean, whether it's, whether I want to, you know, I mean, whether everyone goes to therapy, does their own work, um, and, and also on the same, on the same, um, but also with corporate America, I mean, if implementing change in company policy, I mean, it, it, I think it goes really deep. I mean, people, we need to look at corporate America completely differently. I mean, I'm not even sure why we have companies that are so big. I mean, it does come from ego. It does come from too much masculine energy, right? And people are suffering because of it. So it's not like a small thing to ask. I mean, it is going to require a revolution, but that's what we need. We're suffering. I mean, you know, if like we have this much suffering going on outside, we see this every day in the news. How can we not? I mean, you know, it's, it's almost like your question in reverse, right? Like you're saying, can we have, can we just stop at the personal? Well, what about what's going on out there? Can it, can it just stay out there? Mm. You know, I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, guys, I'm gonna throw something in there. Do, have you guys experienced? Like, I had this chance with my mom. Like, I I noticed that she went got really sad and depressed with the news and everything during the pandemic. And there was this like weird moment. I had to actually grab my mom at one point and be like, "Mom, like you gotta enjoy life. Like you gotta enjoy it. Like you can't be in this space of fear all the time." And the news is kind of pushing that and propagating that. Did you guys experience that with your families or whatever? Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I experienced that myself also because the news, like if you're watching the news to uh, an, an, an extensive level, like it does begin to just brainwash you and pump fear into you. Like it's bound to happen if you're watching. And it was on the news constantly. They use colors very uh, strategically, right? Like talking about mindfulness, but they have the red box with like, here's the number. They only showed the death rate. What about the people that are surviving? Like just certain things that kind of begin to spark that fear in your mind versus like a sense of calm or like, okay, we, we can, we're going to be okay or hope like that wasn't what was coming out. So for me personally, it was like after the first like two or three days, I'm like, I'm shutting this down and I'm limiting my news intake, upping my like self-care practices. And I told the same thing to my parents. I'm like, you can't just sit here and watch the news all day. Like you just need to be out. Like we're fine. We're going to follow the precautions and we're going to be okay. But yeah, the news definitely um, is a source of that. Mm. Here. 
it feeds yeah. it feeds into fear yeah that's already there and like the pain the ignorance um it's really unfortunate for sure and the control right like you pump that much fear and then you in a way get to control people's minds it's it's scary and gross like but that's what's happening um and that's where mindfulness is like the opposition of that right like and it takes a lot more work because consuming the news is very passive you sit there and it's just coming and you're just absorbing it versus mindfulness is very active and that's why it's so challenging for people to do because it's not relaxing it's not easy you're sitting there you have to actively work on these thoughts and like regain control over your mind which 99% of the day is like being influenced by all of this stuff without your permission, so to say. So you get this small percentage where you're trying to counteract all of that. When, when I, when I teach, uh, when I work with kids and te especially teenagers, one of the main things that the way that I explain mindfulness or meditation or whatever, I'm like, this is a way for you to filter information. Right. And like understanding that it's mindfulness and meditation. A good practice of that is actually understanding when stuff is coming in your mental diet, not just your physical diet. And then you can create these filters and like move the filters left and right. Kind of like you toggle, you know, the, 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 the settings on your, like your TV or whatever. You could be like, all right, I'm only going to let in this kind of stuff. And I'm going to, I'm going to turn this stuff down and I'm going to turn the volume down on that stuff. Right. So even when it hits you, you're like, oh, you can laugh at it. You're like, oh, that's whatever dude. It's like, it doesn't even phase you. Right. But it is practice and we have to practice these filters. Right. And that's, that's kind of, why we need to not just introduce it to our parents and aunties and uncles, but like, what about the kids? Like I have my nephew and niece and I see like what it's doing to them. And I'm like, holy shit, we got to reach out to like these guys and th their parents are not doing it. Right. And they're like family. So like their uncle, their grandparents are not doing it. So like, who's, who's reaching out right now, you know? And then all of those Bollywood serials and all of that added to, to it, you know, that, that just corrupts their mind completely. But I'm so glad you brought that up our mental diet, because that is our next conversation in two weeks, we're gonna be talking about mental diet. Uh, mental so yeah. Diet. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be eating that up, bro. I'm gonna eat that up. <laughs> I, I want to comment comments. about those uh, Indian cereals. So you know they were gone for a, a bit, right? Like during the early days of the pandemic, they recently just started up. So my mom hadn't been watching them, and then and she all the time she's like, oh, I'm sleeping so well. I'm sleeping so well. She was having these great nights, and then they started up, and like literally two days later, she's like. I don't know, like I had really bad anxiety last night. I don't, what did I eat? What was this? I need a pill. And I was like, mom, what changed? You started watching those dramas again. You watch them right before you go to sleep. But they're just so intense. They have the music, it's like, it's yeah. like intense stuff going on. You don't think that's been, that's circulating in your brain while you go to sleep? No, 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 it can't be the dramas. It just it can't be the dramas. <laughs> oh, no, my, no, my, my dramas, I'm taking my dramas. <laughs> Yo, that's oh, mindfulness though. She made the connection, that's so powerful, you know? That, so, yeah, that's she, amazing. Well, no, she didn't make the connection. I made the connection. <laughs> you made the connection. Somebody made the connection. And I was trying to introduce it, thinking she could adopt it. She's like, no, I'm going to call the doctor. I think they need to change like this. Oh, <laughs> oh, 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 man. How help me convince people that these dramas? I was like, you know what? I'm not even trying to take your dramas away. Just watch them in the earlier part of the day. Yeah. Dude, I just, I just, I'm just, i just annoyed that I can't like watch football games or basketball games and stuff. Like, it's like, yeah, you put the thing on. I recorded it. I'm like, dude, like, you recorded it too. What the hell? <laughs> yeah. Also, I mean, on that topic, I, mean, I don't know about you guys, but I mean, especially with everything going on with the movement, with police brutality too, like, it's it's been getting to me. I mean, I'm not one that, like, you know, is like, a, I, don't, I, I don't watch UFC. I don't watch boxing. I'm not very desensitized to violence. So, I mean, and I don't think police brutality is a new thing either. I just think, you know, it's getting recorded and, you know, people are talking about it more now. But the floods and floods of videos, I mean, it's been traumatizing and re-traumatizing to see that. And, it, and, and if anything, I've been like wondering why isn't everybody else affected by it the, the way I've been affected by it. But again, it's just like that numbing, <clears throat> like you and your mom like are seeing that so differently. Like you might watch those dramas and be like, yeah, that would totally screw up my sleep. And I would see, I, mean, I would see that connection, mm -hmm. but she doesn't, she doesn't even see that. But I wish, I wish more people would make these connections. Like everything, we are always absorbing so many things and it affects us. Yeah. Oh God, oh God, look how much violence, like our, our TV shows, our movies, we, 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 deif we deify the villains in our shows. Look at how many TV shows are about the villain, right? Being fucked mm -hmm. up shit. Think about our movies. Yep. Think, what, holy shit, like, it's like so much desensitization. That's why, that's why we get away with war. You think like, honestly, people would want 
war ever. Like we're okay with it because it's not us. We see it all the time. We're like, that's not us. So it's over there. You over know, there. I'll tell you, I was watching Travelers. Like currently, I'm watching Travelers, this, the, the TV series on Netflix. And right now, we're at the episode where there's a pandemic going on. No joke. And there have been other TV shows that I've I've heard about where they have an episode of pandemic. Not recently. This was last year. This was a few years ago. So they've been putting the messages out there. They there was been... a pandemic show that came out earlier this year. Yeah. They've been programming us to get used to this pandemic environment. And they had masks on just like we have the masks on. They had everything in that TV show. It's crazy. Crazy. And, I, know, and that's why I mean, that's why we need mindfulness. We need the social revolution. I mean, like that'll that hopefully will show people this is such a there's such a disconnection with this pandemic. I mean, you know, like I would be so sad if India you wore that mask this entire conversation. We'd miss out on all these expressions of yours, you know? Like there's so much connection that that we can't just substitute with with this, like Zoom, with with masks or any of this. And so I hope that I hope this isn't the new normal, you know? Well, well you know, I, for us, we have to be conscious of this too, you know, from, I don't know, uh, from the medical background and some of my colleagues are, you know, you know, in the space, it is profound how we're not talking about the way we eat, right? The way that we take care of our bodies and our minds, right? Like that's, you have, have you heard anybody from CDC say anything? Have you heard any Dr. Fauci? Have you heard anybody officially like say, hey, you guys, what? We have six out of 10 Americans have chronic disease. Like, I and know. most of the people who die from this virus have chronic disease. Like, wait a second. Like, maybe we should address chronic disease. <laughs> and, uh, like, what a great time. They have a captive audience, right? Like, people are listening to them. Why not deliver some of these other, like, healthy guidelines while they're, they have people's yeah. attention? Like, eat healthy. Like, do this. Meditate. What if they were, like, meditating on these shows alongside this? That would be freaking amazing. <laughs> I know. And you have to question that. It's like, you know, instead it's... uh it's fear mongering, you yeah. know? And and there's a, there's someone I follow, maybe you guys know a food babe. Um, she's She's been talking about this for a while and she's like, yeah, there's politicians talking about wear a mask, pandemic, this and that, but posting pictures with McDonald's. That the government, you know, it is a little bit of a hypocrisy. Yeah, you're right. You can't, you can't tell people to wear a mask and stay inside and then not, you know, address everything else too because it is going to lead to, to other issues. So, so, let me, so let me throw something in there uh, uh, to, to add up to the social revolution thing. I think, you know, in, in, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but in yoga philosophy, right, in the Vedantas, um, and one of my, my mentors and teachers taught me this, um, there's something called Nagarik Shastra, Nagarik Shastra, right, which is the yoga of, um, the yoga of politics, right? And like, so yoga is not just about doing yourself it's also being connected to how resources are managed, how power is managed, how, what's goes on, right? Like, are we cultivating our community, right? That's a part of practicing yoga. Yeah, that, have you, you, some of you guys have gone yoga, done yoga teacher training. Did you ever freaking learn that? Like, what the fuck? That's, that's what we're talking about, appropriation of yoga. Like, they take all this knowledge, but then they only take, like, what, what you know, fits nicely and comfortably for people in their world and they don't have to be bothered, right? So these like yoga moms in Malibu don't have to be bothered with like, hey, actually you, you're so wealthy, it's time to get involved and give back. Maybe it's time to help out new leaders who are gonna help. So anyways, all of us, as we're practicing this mindfulness, wherever you guys are at, whoever's watching this, it's a challenge, right? That like, if you are cultivating your mind and body, get involved with politics, you have more resiliency. Maybe we can make public policy, just even for our, not even for the country, we can make policy in our city so that we can all be healthier and we can get back to living regular lives even better. Maybe not even regular lives. Maybe we can be healthier and happier. Like that's, but we can do it with public policy. It's not some private industry. We can do it within our communities using public money. That's like, so we're not even using our money. I mean, we could do that, but we have to get involved. We actually have to socially take our consciousness, our mindfulness and put it into like, also public policy and public mindfulness. <laughs> this is as you're talking about like mindfulness and like even like the appropriation of yoga, what came to mind, like when I've been teaching yoga for a long time and actually the first training I did was in India. So, and it was back when they weren't teaching yoga the way they are now in India. It was really as a therapy and it was, you know, people came to this class. I came because I just wanted to take a class. I didn't know that it was done differently, but they ask people what their ailment was and based on their ailment, they prescribe them yoga asanas to do. And then the teacher walked around. I was like, what is this? And they're like, what's your ailment? I'm like, I don't know. I'm in my early twenties. I'm here to take a yoga class. And so they assigned a teacher to work with me. And then later they were like, you should take our teacher training. So I did. And I learned 
somewhat of what you're talking about, not so much the politics, but how it's deeper than the body. It's really all about the mind. Um, and yoga, the asana practice was designed to tire your body out so that you could sit and meditate, right? But if we really like held on to therapeutic aspects of it, maybe we could have gotten yoga therapy to be something like acupuncture, where it is um, more of a healing practice and less of a fitness practice. And same thing with meditation. And so then it's covered by health insurance, right? Like now it's not. Now it's more of like it's a like a physical, like a workout type of practice. For, for, the, for the fluent, you know, for those that can afford yeah. it. Yeah. But there, there's some change that could be made there as you're talking about like policy changes. Like I know back in the day there was um, a policy, like just an, uh, a petition going around, let's try to get this included. Some, and it was kind of around the time that Chinese medicine was um, converting to more of a therapy. And so let's do this with yoga. And then it didn't go anywhere but there's a lot of opportunity there with these practices so, so I, I don't know about you guys i'm gonna plug something i i'm i'm working on a um a democracy platform with a couple of programmers and we like kind of we're, we're trying to uh, encourage civic engagement in local communities and connecting people online like a social media for democracy but like over local issues that they can like get together on and then go to the city hall and like propose things and like and we're incentivizing we're trying to find a way to not just not just get people to do it, but also maybe they can earn money or it's gamified, right? So if they like get involved, the more they get involved, they get, they get incentivized. But we need to like do new ideas and projects like this that are gonna like kind of engage this. And maybe there's, maybe it's like a kitty party. We could have a kitty party that's like about like, you know, helping out our community or elders or something, right? You gotta make it into Pokemon Go. <laughs> that's that's when people are gonna actually take action. They'll show up to the city hall because it's on the app. <laughs> sure the uncles can have like a drinking party and talk about what issues they can take to their city hall, you know, if they want to like have some drinks that night or something. I don't know, but like we all can start being a little bit more intentional about our gathering, right? Like yeah. right now, especially, you know? Yeah. Now I love that you bring up, you bring up uh, politics because I feel like South Asians especially don't have much of a representation in, in politics because we're not encouraged to go in that line. And I feel like I need to do an episode on how people, how us South Asians can get into politics and what's, you know, talk to politicians who are currently doing it. I, I have some friends who are Indian. I like, wrote is a good friend of mine if you want to like get That'd them That'd be on. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to. I'd love to do that because I think we definitely need to get involved because, I mean, we don't have a representation at all. We, our voices are not being heard because we are not unified. All South Asians are all different. We're all, even though we're Indian, we're all we're different colors, and we you know get differentiate based on that. We're from different parts uh, parts of the country, and we differentiate based on that. And so it's everything. I think we need to you know have that uh, unification so we can all combine our uh, you know unite together. And I feel like the British did that on purpose. Like they fucked us. They fucked us good. That you know the Mughals and then the British. They like back to back. We had like back to back dynasties. Fuck us. <laughs> like, literally fuck us, dude. We're like, yeah, two, three hundred years at a time, uh, if not more. And I feel like that's where mindfulness comes in, is to understand how we've been fucked up, fucked up because of colonialism and all the you know, issues that we've had. Uh, we, don't trust, we don't trust each other anymore, Varun. Like, we don't trust each other anymore. Like, or support neighbors. each other. Yeah. yeah each other and it comes to, back down to like having those open transparent authentic conversations um and building that trust slowly right like piece by piece because right now it's like i even noticed like even my parents are like oh no no i don't want to go to an indian doctor because like who do they like who knows who they know like no one thinks anything's wow gonna <laughs> start talking um <laughs> and I won't, I'm not going to lie, like, there's like, times like that thought goes through my head, like, do I want to go to an Indian therapist or not? Like, you know, like, because can we all trust each other? And that's something we need to build. We need to start having circles where it's not just about being the cool kid and like doing all the, the high profile, whatever. Like, or we need to put, or, or we need to start putting LSD in our parents' jaw or something, you know, like to expedite, expedite things. One time I gave my, my nanny an, an edible and she freaked out. Like, you can't do that. You gotta... <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I freaked out from edibles, bro. I freaked out from edibles. Edibles are threatening, man. You don't know how strong they are. Yeah, they yeah exactly. <laughs> was, your nan was your nanny like rolling like Cheech and Chong style? Like driving her? <laughs> <laughs> no, she just kept tripping out like the bed wasn't even. She's like, my bed isn't even. Like, and oh, that's all. <laughs> daddy. <laughs> yeah. And I, I told my parents, they were just like laughing about it, but. I mean, yeah, 
I wish, honestly, yeah. You're. I mean, it's amazing that you talk to people about like LSD and such and, and hallucinogens. I mean, there's there's a lot of beauty. I mean, and that's the thing, right? I mean, I think we as, as, as Indians have like stigmatized a lot of things within ourselves. And, and this is where we can learn from other cultures, you know? And so, you know, I do, I would say like, I do feel pretty attacked by mindfulness and the way it's kind of going because it is a lot of it is based in our culture and, and kind of like prostituting it out you know mm-hmm. i don't like that mm-hmm. but on the same side you know i think there's a lot to learn from other cultures and in you know the research done with with mental health i mean think about like boundaries for instance i mean indians know nothing about boundaries and that's not something you know <laughs> i've learned from anybody in my culture so yeah there's that. and expressing your boundaries right yeah. like you just kind of like some people become pushovers and they're just, or like, and becoming like constantly looking back from that validation from your parents, especially I decided I was med school bound, decided not to go to med school. So it was this constant, like, is this good enough? Is this good enough? Like, is this all this other stuff I'm doing? And um, being in that mindset and then eventually recognizing like, nope, this is who I am. And these are the, the boundaries of like what, what someone can and cannot say. Yeah. Hey guys, real quick. So we got about 10 minutes left. I'm going to put one last question and get everyone's uh, views on that. Uh, so moving forward, what can we do different in mindfulness? How do we get the mic out of the mic mindfulness and you know, get back to the mindfulness portion? Uh, Shafali, you want to start off with that? Uh, I think coming together as community, especially as South Asians, like we, we've mentioned it so many times in this talk, like there is a lack of trust we come from a culture of and like it's it's caused a lot of separation a lot of suffering and um it's it's also going from microcosm to macrocosm in a way that can continue to spread and i truly feel that there's something to be said about healing generational kind of patterns um the patterns from your lineage and kind of spreading out to that macrocosm through like you know what we've accomplished like as individuals and bringing it to our community in that way basically not stopping at the personal level but taking it outside and going into society yeah and also just real quick um i when i started my skincare line 12 years ago i was still kind of caught up in the whole like um separateness of like not being able to trust indians having a very skewed perception of you know um the culture i come from and it's only through writing this book coming out in like a week i i was i talk i reflect on the past 20 years of my life and struggles but it goes back further into like you know the suppression my mom had and how it got passed down and like what that looked like and how there were things that were happening that were healing for me writing the, the book but then the second portion of the book is the spiritual guide to like what I call higher consciousness. And it's um, the step one is spaciousness and boundaries. It's coming from like my own experiences of like, okay, well, what were the steps that really helped? And I'm actually, I worked with my publisher to get it translated in Hindi just so that I know for my parents, they'll prefer to read it in Hindi versus English. You know, I think they're, they're in for a lot of, you know, when they read the book, I, I don't like, you know, I, I go into every, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, everything, you know, it's all in there, you know, and it's like, but at the same time that to undo the Lokyakenge was extremely empowering, right? Like, wow, like it, I held on to those stories for years. I was not sharing them though I knew I wanted to. And so not only did I kind of heal myself and still on a path, right? It's not just like one day you're like completely enlightened and that's it. It's like a practice. That's why this is, pra- these are practices. Um, but there's like something to be said about how to bring our community together. And I hope translating the book in Hindi helps to do that. Um, but also I think there's a reason we've all come together. I love this, like, this is great. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Shafali. Uh, you, you wanna add something to that? Yeah, taking the muck out of mindfulness. The muck. (laughs) 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 Um, I think uh, I was so like in tune with what Shafali was saying that I didn't. (laughs) 
really think about the, the question, but coming back to the self and the self practice, but not forgetting to apply it out into the world. And that could be in whatever way, uh, shape or form. Like when I do things with the stress detox, I basically use mindfulness as a tool of developing self-awareness so that you can become your own like detective and find out where stress is hidden in your life because we're all aware of like the external stressors or like more of like the overt stressors but it's really like those hidden stressors that may be that nagging in our dialogue or like something that's there that you're not addressing or you're suppressing that really like begins to release cortisol into your system slowly slowly over time and it doesn't affect you one day two day but it's just there like a slow drip iv until one day you have some sort of chronic condition recognizing really what that stressor is by going into a space of inquiry, asking questions, and then like being empowered to do something about it. There are so many amazing tools out there that we're all doing and people are still wondering, well, why is everyone so stressed out? Well, when are you doing these tools? Are you doing them at the beginning of the day and at the begin end of your day? Or are you really recognizing, you know what? This was a challenging conversation. I'm going to need five minutes after this and taking that break when you need it versus saying, I'm going to power through it. Mm. So a, a taking a tool that's extremely, like I call it like one of like our highest technologies, which is meditation, and then really applying it in your day-to-day -day life, applying it strategically in relation to one another and having the courage to do that right? Like having the courage to say, hey, I'm going to do a five minute meditation. And the people around you might look at you like strange, even though meditation's popularized when you're actually doing it with people, it's not, but, you know, you still kind of get that look of like, oh, you're, that's something you're supposed to do like behind closed doors. Like we're not supposed to talk about that in public. Um, but taking that time for yourself and having the courage to do that. All right. Thank you, Ritu. Onkar, you want to add something? Yeah, um, I, I would say, yeah, it starts, you know, everyone just needs to commit to themselves. I mean, when we talk about, I look at anyone, like whether you're in a position of power, I mean, we're all in some sort of positions of power in terms of just affecting other people. I mean, when we talk about Rita, that police officer, right? I mean, I mean, if he just, you know, like, if he like committed to crying and crying and, and just like getting in touch with his emotions and, and what that would do, like you were saying, right, for his coworkers and for civilians. I mean, if all police officers committed to that, maybe we wouldn't be in this predicament with brutality. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, you know, just even us, like our existence, like the fact that there are people like us that exist is so powerful and it's, an, it's you know, you attribute it to doing the work. And I would say moving forward to continue helping and contributing to taking the mick out of mic mindfulness is to, stay on that path. I think even for me, I mean, it's taken me all these years to get to a place where I'm comfortable crying and feeling my emotions. I've been, I've been committed to that my entire life, you know, because yes, as a man, you know, as a Punjabi man, I've been like completely discouraged from doing that. And, and so now I, I try to take my ego out of it. And, and yes, I mean, I'm always pressured to, you know, like have results and, you know, be a provider and this and that. But at the end of the day, I have to remind myself, like just me being a Punjabi male, a straight male that's comfortable with his emotions. I mean, just like a, the other month, I like posted a selfie of myself crying. I was like, you know, this is very like, you know, hard to do and like, you know, but it, it, it's so powerful to, for just someone to see that and, and give them permission to do that. And, you know, openly talk about mental health. And I, I want to continue on the journey. I have so many other things I want to get in touch with. And, 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 and I'm committed to that myself. And I know that it doesn't stop here. So just the existence of like, you know, us being on the path is, is doing wonders for the, the ones around us, I think. Thank you, Ankar. Indy? Oh, wow. Um, uh, return to the Mac, huh? Mac, 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 Mac mindfulness, um, getting the Mac out. Um, so, you know, I, I think I would like to first preface this answer with the idea that there, there is no scarcity. You know, like there is no scarcity. Like that's totally, that's a false narrative that like all of us have been programmed with from the start. It's unfortunate, but that was a, a part of maybe the, the, the socioeconomic conditions of both, you know, whether we are immigrants or whether we were from India, in India itself as well, because of all the colonial, um, because of all the colonial, you know, influence too, like the, the lack of resources that happened. Um, but actually like what do we really want we want to feel safe 
we want to feel secure, we want to feel, we want to be nour nourished, right? Those are all available actually at a community level. So like, you know, that's why we have gurdwaras, right? Or we have these play ashrams, right? At the end of the day, we as a community can come together and help each other, even in a calamity, even in a natural disaster, even in like a, there's always that, that can happen, right? And so we know we've, we've seen it happen. We're seeing it happening right now. So there's no scarcity. If we can understand there's no scarcity, by, when you practice mindfulness or you want to share mindfulness, there's never any worry that you're not going to be taken care of, right? And where mindfulness gets abused is like, oh my God, I need to use this to get pay my bills. I need to use this to, I need to use this to do something, right? But you don't need it to do anything. It's actually just sharing knowledge and wisdom and love and compassion and empathy and possibility, potentiality. That's like, how do you value? I always, when I, when, when, when corporations ask me like, oh, how much should we, should we charge you? What's the, what, what's your invoice, right? And you send us how much it'll cost. And I'm like, what? How do I like, I like sit there. Literally, I, sometimes I sit, I have to go for a walk and be like, I don't know. Like, I don't know how to value something that you can't quantify. Yeah. What, you know, yeah. like getting people to be inspired to like take care of themselves. That's fucking infinite. You can't, give me your first child. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like, like how, do I how do I value that, right? So. So coming from getting rid of that space of scarcity, right, then eliminates the mick aspect of it. You don't need to make money, right, from it. Now, if you do make money, whatever, maybe you could donate some of that to something. Like maybe if you are doing that space, maybe you can start to understand that you're never at a lack. So even if you're making some money from your mindfulness, maybe you can give some of it back to maybe the community you get it from. Let's say you learn something, a kundalini. Let's say you learn a kundalini practice. Maybe you can help, uh, you can support a school in India that's for girls, a school for girls in India. Right? And like, well, holy shit, like think about that cycle, the cyclic thing. If you're doing ayahuasca retreats, maybe you can like support a, an indigenous tribe or maybe some lawyers in like South America who are fighting for indigenous rights. I mean, there's so much cool stuff you could do, cyclic stuff. And it's not, at the end of the day, it's for you. Like if we practice that kind of mindfulness, it actually makes us stronger. <laughs> like it makes us more powerful and happy. Like literally we're more joyful when we do stuff like that. So that's how, for me, that's the best way to take my, the mick out is like, no, no more scarcity. Let's give. Let's just give all this stuff away, and it'll will be taken care of. Yeah, infinite abundance. I love that. Love and abundance. Yeah, that's what it's about. Um, all right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, panelists, Ritu, Shafali, Indy, and Onkar, for sharing your stories and for engaging us in a discussion about these issues. Thank you for our audience for you know being engaged for sharing your views. Uh, I'm going to upload this video on YouTube, so if you missed it, if you missed a part of it, I will definitely send out a link in the coming days. If you have any conversation, if you have any comments about these conversations, if you have any topics that you'd like to see, please hit me up and let me know. Thank you to our sponsor, Nita Naturals. Also, I want to point out that our next conversation, like we mentioned earlier, is on August 20th. It's called Our Mental Diet. And it's from 8 to 10 p.m. Pacific time. What's the mental diet? It's just like uh, the food that we eat. Our body needs some food. Our mind needs uh, a mental diet as well. So it's, we're going to be talking about what we're feeding our, sub our mind consciously. We're going to be talking about what we feed our mind subconsciously. And these are important questions because they affect who we are throughout our lives. And... That's basically all I have for now. So thank you everybody for showing up. Until then, love and abundance. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Danyavad. 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 I want to do a screenshot. Can we do a screenshot? Yes. Danyavad.